Thank you very much, Lee and Pam. That was a wonderful presentation again of, a, of, a, of another hymn that's a favorite of mine. Our scripture today is one of my favorite stories from the New Testament. It's, um, <laughs> it's a fun story. It's sweet. It's a little silly. Um, it's about friendship. It's about healing. It has a happy ending. And I think it it's, um, must have been one of the favorites in the early church because it appears in almost identical form in the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke. It's, uh, it's also one that has been picked up and popularized in a, in a children's song, I know. And, well, I'm going to sing a little of it. <laughs> I'm not, I don't usually sing, and, and you, you may understand why in just a couple of minutes. There's a hole in my roof. It's the truth. I wouldn't spoof. It was put there for a man with diseases who needed to get in and see Jesus. Why didn't they use the door? Didn't they know what a door is for? But the man was sick and the crowd was thick, so they had to go through the second floor and refrain. It, um, it is, as I said, a sweet, picturesque, kind of silly story. Of course, if that's all it was, it wouldn't have ever made it into the Gospels. It's also a story that I think teaches us some things we need to know about healing, about forgiveness. There was a paralyzed man. We don't know what the cause of his paralysis was. We don't know to what degree he was paralyzed, only that he couldn't get around on his own. He had to be carried. Well, four of his friends heard that Jesus, the, the healer with the wonderful reputation for doing miraculous things, was in town. And they decided, hey, we've got, our friend has a problem. And here's a solution. We just need to put the two together somehow. So they went to their friend and they picked him up on the mat he was lying on. And they each you know, took a corner apparently and they, and they walked, carried him through the streets of the town until they got to the house where Jesus was. Jesus was inside teaching. And the house seems to have been packed. So much so that there was a crowd around the house and you couldn't even get to it, let alone get to Jesus. They decided to come up with, um, with a really interesting sort of solution. They had creative problem-solving skills. And so they went up on the roof. Now, what happens next is, is, is very interesting to me. I remember learning about this in seminary. And it tells us a little bit about how stories were told in New Testament times. What we think happened is that Mark, Matthew, and Luke all had the same story. They all knew the same basic thing, but they weren't entirely sure of some of the small details, and so they adjusted as the story was told and retold. Mark's is the one that's probably the closest to the historical fact. And Mark, they get up on the roof, and it appears that this is a thatch roof because they just they scoop out a hole in the thatch and lower the man down. Uh, Matthew doesn't mention what the roof is made of. He just says they made a hole. Luke, on the other hand, does mention what the roof is made of, and it's not thatch. It's a tile roof, and so they have to <clears throat> they have to chop a hole in the roof and move the tiles out of the way to let the man down. Uh, much more destructive. And then they lower him down. And here's, here's the other big difference in the ways the story are told, is told. In Mark, Jesus, uh, the man is lying on a mat, something like a sleeping bag or a comforter um, that he could lie or sit on. And they just take it 
and use it like a stretcher or maybe a sling, and they lower him down into the room, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, Luke doesn't mention. They, he just says they lower him down. Matthew gets a little puzzled here because he knows that they're carrying him on the thing that he usually lay down on, but he's not quite sure what that is. And so when they bring the man to Jesus, he says they carried him on his bed, which makes kind of an interesting picture for a man parading through the city with a friend on a bed. But then when he gets up to the roof, it's like Matthew realizes it doesn't make any sense to lower this piece of furniture down through a hole in the roof. And so he tries to come up with something more reasonable. He says they lowered him on the couch into the house. And then Jesus says, well, rise, take up your bed and walk. And Matthew really gets stuck here because it's, you know, it's kind of like, well, you can't tuck a bed or a couch under your arm and go walking. So he says, so a man rose and he took the thing he'd been lying on and he walked. <laughs> it is uh, in the essentials, though, that they got all the details the same. The man is lowered down to speak to Jesus, and the first thing Jesus does is a little unexpected, because he doesn't heal the man. He says, your sins are forgiven. Well, that wasn't what the guy had come there for. I'm sure he was happy to hear it. Now, it, it sounds almost like Jesus is saying, okay, you have committed sins that have caused your paralysis. And now I'm going to forgive you, and then that's going to permit the healing. But that's not really the way the story tells it. Jesus forgives the sins, and only a little later does he heal the man. It's kind of like these are two different actions, two different solutions for two different problems. I think the reason he says what he says is because he, he wants to get the forgiveness out there first. Because in the crowd in the house, there are a number of legal scholars, scribes, and so forth. And he knows that they're trying to catch him saying something wrong or, or, or something that will make him look bad. Because you know, they tended to evaluate new preachers like this. And they rose right to the bait. How can you forgive this man? Who can forgive sins except God? Are you putting yourself in the place of God? And that's when Jesus responds to a question, as he so often does when dealing with his critics with another question. So, ah, well, you think I, I don't have the authority from God to heal this man? Well, tell me, which is easier, to forgive someone for their sins or <clears throat> to tell somebody who's paralyzed to stand up, take up their mat, and walk? They don't answer, and the answer is, is, is kind of obvious to us. You can't heal like that except through the power and the authority and the grace of God. So Jesus, when he tells the man to stand, take up his mat, and walk, he really kind of steals all the oomph out of their argument. They're not able to say anything more because someone who has the authority to do something spectacular, <clears throat> like take away a man's paralysis, clearly is working under the authority of God. And therefore, when he says your sins are forgiven, they must be forgiven. Now, we can kind of think that this is something that maybe only Jesus did because Jesus was special. But Jesus tells his followers and by extension, us, 
to go out and do the same, to forgive, to open up wholeness and healing for people. And I think that's important. And I think it makes sense to tell stories of healing and forgiveness together, be not because not because sin causes illness, but because forgiveness facilitates healing. There was a, a situation, and this isn't exactly a story of forgiveness, but I think it makes an important point. I was um, I did a summer program called Clinical Pastoral Education when I was in school and uh, worked with a, a hospital chaplain during that. And he told me and the several other students that were working there, he told us that um, about an experience he'd had when he was younger working in a hospital setting. He said there was, um, there were two men, I don't think it was at the same time, there were two different cases that he knew of. They were very similar in some ways and completely opposite in another. The two men came in with a very serious cancer and uh, each of them was, was given a, a bad prognosis, only a matter of weeks or months to live. One man responded to it angrily. It was so unfair. And he, he was frightened. He lashed out at everyone. He lashed out at his doctors and his healthcare workers for not doing more for him. He lashed out at his family. He lashed out at his friends. He was bitter and angry and so miserable because of the unfairness of the disease. Fortunately for him, they found some very effective treatment in his case. And within a few weeks, the cancer was in full remission and he was able to go back to his life. Although he went back still an angry and bitter man. The other man had been given a very similar diagnosis, but he responded very differently. He said, you know, I have been living my life as if I had all the time in the world. I've spent too much time at work. I've neglected my family. I've let friendships grow strained and, and, and cool. I've neglected my spiritual life. I think this is really a wake-up call. This is a chance to live my life differently to celebrate each day for the opportunities it brings, to reconnect with my family and, and make as many good memories with them as I can while I'm here with them, whether that's a few months or, or hopefully many years. This is a chance to reconnect with old friends and to heal whatever rifts there might be there. This is a chance to, to pray and to, and to, to reconnect, to restart my spiritual life, to renew my relationship with God. He did not respond well to treatment and he died a short time later, but he died leaving family and friends with those good memories. In fact, even the doctors and the nurses and the, and the technicians said what a joy it was to be with him during his time in the hospital because he was, he was so kind. He was so compassionate and he was so much at peace. You don't normally think of a situation like that as, as one of sin and forgiveness, but I think there's, there is that element there. The first man lived a life of, of, I think, what you could call sin because he 
he had his own agenda and it was very selfish and very inward looking and anybody who didn't help fill his needs in the way he wanted, he would push away. He created barriers between himself and others, between himself and God. And I think that's, in the end, what sin is. A barrier that limits our relationships with each other, with God, with the created world. The other man saw that his life had been somewhat like that too, and he repented. And repenting, the Greek word is metanoia, it literally means turning around or turning away. He turned away from that way of living, and it gave him a chance to do things differently. After he told us these stories, the chaplain asked, okay, which, which one received healing? He didn't answer it. I think it's a question more to ponder than to try to come up with a glib answer for. But I do think that it tells us something about the nature of healing and forgiveness. When we offer forgiveness, and forgiveness is is criticized a lot right now in the world because people see forgiveness as, okay, we're going to let you off. There are going to be no consequences for the terrible things you've done. We're going to pretend it never happened, and you just don't have to deal with it. But that's not what forgiveness is, not, not in the scriptures. Forgiveness is saying there may have to be consequences, but they won't come because I hate you. They won't come because I think you're less than human. They won't come because I want to hurt you or have revenge. They'll come because actions have consequences. They'll come because when you try to change your life, that's hard work. And when you want to heal divisions you've caused, that's real effort. But forgiveness says, if you're going to make that effort, I'm going to hold a space open for you. There may be this barrier between us and God, between us and other people, kind of like an impenetrable roof that we can't get through. But when friends forgive, it's a little like making a hole in that roof. So as we think about healing, let's think about forgiveness. We can't always do things that will take a person's diseases or problems away but we can always make a hole in the roof.